Hey there, Wendy here with Jazzy Doodle Designs and on tonight's Wind Down Wednesday we're going to be going over all things distressed ink and distressed oxide. So we'll cover some of the tools that you can use to apply these. What is special about distress ink and distress oxide? The differences between the two and we will explore how we can use these in our coloring books. So let's dive in. Okay, so let's talk about the differences between the two. So first off, distressing is done by Ranger and Tim Holtz. And it was designed, I think, primarily for card making and kind of that type of uh, paper craft. But Distress ink is a dye ink. It is a fast drying ink. It is fantastic on white paper. It likes a smoother paper. Distress oxide, on the other hand, is a pigment hybrid. So it's not 100% pigment, but it is more opaque and a little slower to dry. Of the two, I personally find Distress Oxides easier to blend, but in adult coloring, that might, because of their opaqueness, we people might not like working with them as much because if you cross over the black lines, it is going to cover them up, whereas the, the Distress Ink, when you go over the black line, it, it disappears. It's not going to show up on the black lines. So it all depends on the look that you're going for in your coloring. Both inks come in these three by three pads. And they both come in a one by one mini, which I would recommend you start with the minis if you're just kind of dipping your toe in this. I absolutely love these. I own all the colors. I have been collecting these since they first came out. So I only have the three by threes because when they first came out, they didn't have the minis. So I had started collecting these. And then when they came out with the minis, I didn't want to have some that were three by three and some that were minis. Um, but even as much as I use them, and I've used them quite a bit, I, I wish the minis would have came out when I first got them. Just for storage purposes, and because you can re-ink them. So each of them also comes with a re-inker, and you can just, you know, pull it out in the little dropper and re-ink your pads. So... Really, the only time that you would need or prefer maybe a bigger pad would be if you were doing a lot of stamping with larger stamps. But for what we're doing, I think the little minis would be fantastic. And I will show you quite a few different techniques that you can use uh, to apply color to your page. One of which is just using the re-inker as a watercolor. But let's not jump ahead of ourselves too much. Okay, so let's talk about some of the tools that you can use to apply your distress inks. You can use these foam applicators. This one has a flat head. They are just little foam pieces, but you can see it has squared off edges. Or you can use these domed ones, which are round. These also are Velcroed on there and are replaceable. I actually like the domed ones better. These are the newer option of the two. There are these little finger daubers that are kind of a dome top. Now, these do not come off. 
So you replace the entire dauber when, when it falls apart. There are these brushes, which are like makeup brushes that have really soft heads and they come in different sizes and shapes. These I just purchased. I've never used them. I think they'll work great. They have the same type of bristles as these ones, but I think they'll be better for getting into small places, which I didn't really have a need for when I was doing cards. Now, this system, I don't know if these are the brushes or the, yeah, the, the brushes that came with this stand. While it is pretty to have a little rainbow on your desk, I find it very fiddly. If you bump it, the, the brushes fall down and they're hard to, you know, you can't just put them in there quickly like loop because they have to go in this little hole just exactly or they fall out. And so what I do is I just keep all of mine in this little red bucket and I just literally put them all in there. <laughs> These I have These I have stored in a bucket like this with just um, these different heads. I just replaced almost all of my heads because they were falling apart. You can see like here I use a makeup sponge. It's literally disintegrating. And so I just replaced a lot of these. In fact, here I even have a brand new set. This is how they come. So you can buy, this is 20 pieces. The dauber set I store in this little caddy, which honestly I've had it for so long, I don't even know if it was specifically designed for this. It doesn't have any name or brand on it. And you can see a lot of my daubers are very, very well worn and need replaced. And I am not super particular about I started kind of creating a little chart for myself and it just went south. <laughs> so what I find is if you take these and you just rub them on, you know, a towel or something, then as long as you're coming close to this color, when you apply the ink, you get that color. So, you know, I wouldn't want to use a red one with this yellow, but I find that I can use this for pretty much almost any yellow because these become stained. It's not so much that they're still saturated with ink as they are stained. Now, something like this one where you can see it's frayed, this needs replaced. And over time, they just kind of disintegrate. So that's why I replaced a lot of my other ones. But I like this little container. And I definitely haven't used them in a little while. Because I've been coloring. <laughs> now, as far as brushes go, I like... I like that these brushes are color coded. It makes it easy to just keep them in the same color family. So once again, I don't have a separate brush for each color. What I do have is a separate brush for each color family. So I do have a couple of blue ones. This is a black brush, but I use it for blue and I tend to use darker blues here, and then this is more like the medium blues, like this faded jeans color, whereas the tumbled glass would probably be, I would use one of these lighter blue ones. 
what I found, the best way to clean these is just literally, if I was to use this one, I would grab my towel like this, I would rub it. I like the microfiber cloths, and I just rub it on there, and then this is just printer paper. You can see no blue is coming off now. So now I could really use this for any blue I wanted. Let me see if I can get one that I think will transfer color. Okay, so you can see here I transferred a little color with this. If I go in now and use my microfiber towel and just rub it on there, now when I come in, no color transfer. So now I could use this for any green. And once again, I kind of have, you know, like more like my teal blues, my, you know, so I have different ones for the different color families. But most of these, they're not going to transfer a lot of ink. Now, periodically, you want to take these into your kitchen sink and wash them. They take a long time to dry, so I don't do it after every cleaning or after every use. Now, if you were to buy these all black handled ones like this guy, then you could just rub it off in between and use it for whatever color. You could technically use one brush for every ink. You could. I am just way too lazy of a girl for that. So I like these sets that have the colors. Now, I have seen people do different things with the black handled ones. You can put a piece of washi tape around here or a piece of ribbon or a piece of string annotating that, you know, this is your red one, your blue one, whatever. Um, when you start to use them, see, you will start to see the bristles and you can get an idea of what color you are using. But these ones that are brown to begin with, you can tell it makes it a lot harder to tell what is this color. Because the color that came off, none really came off. It's just stained but it makes it a lot harder than the bristles that are white. They will really show the color. So there's that. Now, as far as the foams, one of the things you can do, you can tell that the system is old for me, but you can put a piece of Velcro on the back of your pads. And the mini ones are one inch by one inch and they fit these daubers perfect. But you could just stick one little foam block and then that would be the foam for this color. I know a lot of people that do that. It doesn't really work well for me. You can see even with these flatter uh, foams that they tend to get a little scrunched up for me when I put them away. So my system where I store them is like a cassette holder. That's what it looks like if, you've, if you're old enough to know what a cassette tape is. <laughs> the, the little storage container that I have is like that. And I'll flash a picture up here for you. But what happens is your foam can get kind of scrunched. Once your foam is like this, Technically, I wouldn't recommend using this because you won't get a smooth application because of the the rivers and valleys here of, of this foam. So personally, I will just throw this foam away. But depending on how you store them, this might be a really good workable system for you. But you can see as I lay it down, it does not lay flat because it sticks out. These ones that aren't domed 
would probably do better. There's still a little wobble there, but you probably could stack them. But it's up to you. Personally, I find as long as I keep it in the color family, I don't have any problems. So let's talk about our surface that we work on. Whenever you're working with Distress Sinks, I really like a smooth, non-porous surface. Here I'm showing my tonic glass um, me media mat, and I really enjoy working on this surface. It's smooth. The white is really good for showing color, and I was removing the part that is a non-stick mat. Another option that you have is this non-stick mat. Now I purchased this one directly for crafting and I'll try and find a link for you but you could also use a non-stick baking sheet but these are really nice because they add all the convenience of durable surface but they're very easy to store. As you can tell, this has been very well loved over the years. Okay, so another really good surface, if you find that you like doing this kind of thing, is this waffle flower mat. This is a silicone mat, and what I really like about this mat is when you put your paper down, it does not move. Like, when I'm pushing hard on this, it does not move. That makes it really nice for stamping or stenciling. While it will move, it's just not as prone to move. So it's not sticky, but it does provide a little grip. But because it's silicone, it's really good. It cleans up really nicely and I enjoy working on it. You can even use, this is just a page protector that I have put a piece of cardstock in. You could even use something like this. My final budget option would be the dollar store cutting mats. These are perfect for distressing neo colors or water. I will do half of the card in each. Now, I do recommend that you use these applicators and not the brushes when you use the oxides because oxides have some sort of, the pigment in them can get in your brushes and it's harder to get that out of them, you know, when you're doing the cloth thing that I showed you. So that is just my suggestion. We're going to start with the domed uh, applicator here. And I'm going to go in with my tumble glass. The little speckles that you see on this, if you can see those, those are embossing powders because sometimes when you use embossing powder, it gets everywhere. But what you want to do is you want to... A lot of times people recommend that you daub off. I recommend that you daub off before you start, especially when you're using darker colors. When you're using the really light ones, it's not quite as um, important. A little trick I learned is if you take a little piece of paper towel, doesn't have to be much. But just put your fingers on the paper towel. You can hold your paper down and you don't risk getting fingerprints on your paper because inks are messy. <laughs> okay, inks for Wendy are messy because Wendy tends to be a little bit um, impatient when she does things. So what I want to do is I'm going to start with my lightest and I'm going to go in with a really light hand and starting off the paper I am going to use circular motions 
and a light hand, I am just going to go over my paper. Now you can see where it was darker right there on the edge because I was using a little bit of a heavier hand. And you can go in and you can just keep adding as little or as much as you'd like. And then you can switch your little dauber if you want and go in with your next color. So this is my Broken China, and as you can see, it doesn't pick up super quickly. I find that if you rub them to get them started, you will get a lot more ink than if you just pounce on them. Now that said, you always want to test off, see how much ink you have, and then go lightly you can see how much darker that is. So go lightly in, just barely kissing the paper. And we want to go up a little into our tumble glass. And we want to go down a little into our faded jeans area. Then we're going to come back with our tumble glass. Starting off the paper, nice and light, just kind of going over and blending into that second color. I don't know what that is. Now there isn't a huge difference between these two when I use a really light hand. I can go in and deepen this color And then we're going to go in with our third color. And this time, let's try, let's try our flat dauber. So I pick up some ink, starting off of my page, holding it down. Now you, can you see these actual little marks? As I work, I am going to be working those out, but I personally find it easier to work with the dome because you don't get those. So let me grab one of those. I will just grab a different. And once you get those, as long as you haven't been crazy about it, and went in super, super heavy, we can blend those out. So we're gonna go in, and you can see how much better those blended. And then I'm gonna take it up very lightly into that second color. Then I'm gonna go back to my second color, pick up a little ink, and blend. And I'm deepening up these colors slowly. Going up just a little into the higher part and then picking up my lightest color, pick up some ink, starting off of my page. Using a slightly heavier hand and blending down into that second color. And you can just keep going back and forth until you get the blend that you want. Smoothing, just smoothing in it up, concentrating on these transition areas. The more color that you add, the smoother your blend will be, meaning the more layers, not the more that you add, like you don't want to get crazy, but this, the more times you smooth this out, the better it will get. And I could have um, stayed a little softer there on the top, 
but this is just for demonstration purposes. Now, what's nice is, see, I can come in and pick up this ink and apply here and pick up this ink. This is how I get ink everywhere. <laughs> and apply here. But what's really nice is then I can go in with a little bit of stamp cleaner or whatever and just wipe that off. And cleanup is easy breezy. But you can see I did get ink here. If my fingers were just the thing holding, then I would get ink on my fingers. You can see I have a little ink here. Now when I touch my page, let's just the back of one, this is what you end up with, is you end up with these little smudgies. So I find I really like the paper towel thing. Now for the oxides, what I'm gonna do, and something like this, I would probably take my paper towel and try and blend that out a little bit. If this was the whole page, we could go in with our lighter ink and try and blend that out a little bit more. But that's that's why you gotta be careful about getting those ridges on there. And that's one of the reasons why I love these domes. They work so much better because they don't have that edge to give you an edge, if that makes sense. So I'm gonna put my lids back on these set these aside. We'll be using them again. This side was, let me get a pen. So this was our ink and this is going to be our oxide. So I am going to actually flip my paper upside down because I like working on the right side because I'm right handed. So when I can, I like to do this. If I can't, then you do the best that you can. But given a choice, I am going to use the same sponge uh, applicator. I just do a quick brush off. You can see how much lighter this made this. Now, especially since I have ink here, it's really important to use my little paper towel. Oh, okay, so I'm... <laughs> that won't affect us too much, but we want to make these match. So we're going to put our lightest down here at the bottom. if I can put all this in camera. So just picking up my oxide, starting off the page. I don't know if you can tell how much easier. This was my first one. Just how much creamier these are and how seamless that blend is right there. Going in with my darkest one. So just putting, putting the applicators right there by the ink pads. So now I'm going to go in with my darkest. Kind of going up into that medium tone. Then going back with the medium tone. 
And then one more time with my lightest color there. So when you look at the two, they're very similar in terms of overall effect. But I want to take, so on the back of the page, I'm just going to take some faded jeans and go over the black and then I will take faded jeans here So see, you don't have to work off the page, but you do need to be careful if you're not coming in from off the page. It's very easy if I'm using a dauber or any of the sponge applicators, if I just start here and I put my thing down do you see that little circle? Now I really got to work to get rid of that circle. You can still kind of see the circle. So you have to be careful if you're not coming off the page. Here I'll come off the page. And by working off the page, I don't get these really stark lines. Now you can go in from the center. You just want to start really light and keep adding. So you just don't want to put that kind of thing down. So you, because once you do that, it is really hard to come back from, <laughs> you know, we can really go in there and you're going to have to add an awful lot of color to blend that out. But my point, because I'm going off on a tangent here, is can you see the difference here between the ink and the oxide in terms of the black line. So some might not like that on their color books. So keep that in mind. So let's talk about one of the fun aspects. See, I got a little black mark on there. Um, of the distressed ink. So if I go in with just a spray bottle and I give it a mist, you can see it starting to oxidize. And if I put bigger drops, you can go in and blot these. The bigger your drops, you can And when you get it over the project, you can come in and lot these up. And it just makes really cool effects. And the bigger your blots, the bigger the oxide or the bigger the, the splotch, so you can really mist it. And 
here's the thing. We can keep going in and adding color. So let's say now I wanted to add, well, I got some peeled paint. Let's add a little peeled paint. So I can go in here and I can add colors to this. Now, one thing I will tell you, see how I wasn't very good about putting that on? You do want to try and line that up as best you can, and you'll get a better coverage. So let's add a little oxide here. Can you see how this is more translucent, meaning this green became more of a blue-green, whereas this stayed more of the, the original color that I put on there. But if I go in, I can, I can add my water and it will react again. And the longer you let it sit, the more it will oxidize. But see how it actually oxidized and now it almost removed this green color and the blue kind of pops through. Whereas this one did it a little bit. But overall, you got this blending of colors. So let's go in with an orange because orange is the opposite color. Okay, so whenever you use two colors that are opposite on the color wheel, those are called complementary colors and they will make your colors pop. But if you blend them together, they will make a mud, usually a brown or a kind of a grungy gray. So I'm going to go in with this carved pumpkin distressing on this side and look at the color it makes kind of a brown right so let's go in and let's pick up some orange and go in with our orange here look at the difference this actually keeps the orange color Whereas this completely made a mud. And that is simply because these are translucent inks and therefore are actually blending together. That is one of the, the nice things about the oxides is that because they're more opaque, now you can see behind the orange you can kind of see a little bit of that brown or the darkening, but I just think it's the blue kind of popping through more than the brown. But you can do that with any color. And then once again, those will also react. But look at the, the oxi oxidization with that orange. So I love these inks. I just think that they're fun to play with. You get some really good. These would make fun backgrounds. So let's talk about paper. Here I'm adding it to printer paper. And this is Georgia Pacific cardstock. And as you can see, they just go on a little bit different on different types of paper. Here's the Nina Solar White, 
80 pound, which is a smooth cardstock, and I personally feel like it goes on very well. This last one, I believe, is just a random cardstock, maybe like a Recollections or something like that. As you could tell from the video, it definitely took much more effort to put it on the printer paper than it did the Nina, and it definitely is a much smoother blend on the printer paper and the Nina than it was on the Georgia Pacific or the Recollections brand. So let's talk about colors. So this is my Distress Ink chart. I just recently updated this because now there is 72 colors, I believe. And then on the next page is the Distressed Ink. But what I wanted to show you is looking at these, how, how the colors are the same in both lines. So one of my favorite aspects of the Distress line is the fact that they carry the color, the name of the color and the actual color across all the different products that they do. So whether you're using the, the oxide, the ink, they have a stain, the refills, the crayon, the marker, the watercolor pencil, they also have a spray. They probably have something else too, but these are all mustard seed and you can tell they're all the same color. And I really appreciate that consistency in the brand. Now y'all know, if you've watched my series at all, I, I use this Art of the Mandala just for random stuff. This is my test book. So let's say I was to make a background for this page and I want to go in with my tumbled glass. I can go in. Now this is the lighter of the three colors that we were using, but I would go in, I would put paper behind to protect our book. And then starting off the paper, we could go in and sponge in a background. You got to be careful not to bend the page because where I bent the page, it picked up a little more ink. So now I'm going to have to try and smooth that out somehow or otherwise adjust for it. I could go in with my blending brush and see if that works a little easier. Now I will say I feel like it's easier in the sense that it's not moving my book. I wonder if I could, if I could get my book onto this paper, I would have a much easier time with it not moving. That probably wouldn't work for all books. But if it's an option, or if you're printing your own pages, that would be my suggestion. But it makes a nice background. Now I could come in, let's try these brushes that I bought. So there's a small, in case you didn't see them, there's a small, a medium, and a large. So let's take our smallest one here. And I'm gonna, Put my ink pad there so you can see. But I'm just going to go in and test it over here. I'm 
but this allows me to get into a lot more a lot tighter spaces Now I'm using an, a light hand because I won't want to go in and get, you know, dots going. I do think that these work for sure. Now you can see where you got to be really careful because it's easy to get a lot darker than neighboring colors. I also have these guys, which are really skinny. So let's try that. Let's pick up a little color on that. And now that's an option as well. to get into these little crevices. So there's a lot of different tools, a lot of different sizes. I don't even have all of the sizes. There's little, almost like this, only it's on a handle like this, to where it bends, like this one does. <laughs> it's not a stick, it's a, a brush like this but it would just be one little thing. But I think that these work really well. The advantage to using something like this in your book is that then, look how fast I covered that background. Now I could leave that background like that. I could go in and do, you know, a little bit of that oxidizing So as many of you know, I just started coloring in December. And so I haven't had a chance to use these distress inks in my coloring books. And at the end of this video, I do color a picture with it. I see myself using distress inks more for backgrounds. However, I thought I would show you a couple of little projects that I have done in the past just using distress inks and oxides. I believe the four that I'm going to show you are all oxides. But as you can tell here, these are all from the water. Here's another one. And I just think it adds a really fun almost like a texture. Now this card is essentially the same card as the last one with just a little less of the, the reactivity of the water. And so you can see the different effects that you can get. So I just I love working with the Distress Oxides. I love working with Distress products in general. So I hope that you'll give them a try. Okay, so the last way that I want to mention to use these, and guys, I know this is a long video, but I could go on for another two hours. There's smushing techniques. There's resist. There's all kinds of stuff you can do with these inks. So I want you to know I am running myself in. But I do want to talk about um, using these like a watercolor. So whether you're using the re-inkers you can use these the same way as you do the, the inks. You just smoosh them on your non-porous surface. So it could be a glass mat, any of the, the things that we talked about. I'm just going to use a water brush, but you could use a paintbrush. 
you can make these as diluted as you want. But basically, you're just going to pick up a little color and paint with it. It's that simple. And you can use... You can clean your brush off in between and get pure color. You can go in and mix these to get new colors. Mix a little more blue in that and you get more of a blue green. You can mix your can get a, a purple going. You can get more blue, less pink, and get this color purple. You can mix them with your with your reinkers. I can't even tell you how little you need. Let me show you. So if you want to use it full strength, you can come in and do it that way. But you can also dilute it just a touch. And you saw how little that really was. And that's going to go a really long way. Look how far up into my brush that went. So it really doesn't take much. And like I said, you can mix these. You can stamp with these. You can go in and I would go into your, your color book, <laughs> my pretend color book here, and just literally paint like you would watercolor. And you could use any sort of watercolor techniques that you can do, you could do with these. So the final thing I'm going to leave you with is a time lapse of me doing Matchstick Mouse with nothing but Distress Ink. And if you're really interested in Distress Ink and color books, I would suggest looking up Zucchini Kitty. She has done many, many pages using Distressed Ink, and she's just a really good coloring channel if you're not familiar with her. She is way bigger than I am. She's got some great content on her channel, so I encourage you to give that a look and buy yourself some Distress Ink and have some fun.